This podcast sheds light on the incredible stories of those who served and are now navigating civilian life. Join me as we explore the challenges, triumphs, and unique perspectives of transitioning veterans. From career shifts to mental health, we cover everything. Subscribe now and amplify the voices of our heroes. Amplify Veterans, where every story matters. Another episode of Amplify Veterans, here with Kevin Bright, Army veteran, uh, did about seven years in the Army, and finished off his time with the Army as an O3, a captain. I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Kevin, for a brief introduction uh, about what you, why you joined the Army and what you're up to, and, and we'll get into it. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here and share. Uh, so I guess it all started, a lot of people my age, uh, watching the towers fall on 9-11. I was in seventh grade, very formative period of my time. Um, and there was also uh, an issue with money in college <laughs> when I got a little older. You know, I was fortunate. My dad had been drafted in Vietnam, so he had some experience. So he directed me. He's like, no, you want to you be an officer. Trust me. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get into West Point. So I commissioned through there. I went uh, infantry after that. So very different from what I'm doing now. Now I'm working in the chemical engineering field. The company I work for designs processes that handles acids. So think about corrosive chemicals, hydrogen gas is big. It's a green energy we're seeing a lot of interest in. Um, battery acid. So yeah, I joke that I went from like being a knuckle dragger infantryman to now this like very cerebral uh, chemical guy, and um, quite quite a journey from here to there. So it is. It's, it is different. So I'm glad that you embraced the journey to be able to to do something so different from that. What was West Point like? It was different. I mean, it, I guess like it's if the army ran a college it's exactly what bus point would be <laughs> you know some things i loved about it was that everyone going to school we all knew we were going to work together when we got out right there was a sense of purpose sure i missed out on probably the partying and you know that aspect of it we had formations we had drill we we did tactics we had to pass pt tests academically super challenging it, it was very challenging in a good way right mm -hmm. so i felt pretty prepared um but yeah definitely a unique experience definitely not your typical college experience at all goodness what types of classes did you end up taking when you were when you were there i, I assume you took some military science and and theory type courses but yeah walk me through some of the interesting ones so okay the, the coolest class i took so i was actually a nuclear engineering major and actually, I, I love the story of how I picked that major and it kind of leads into my thought process about my profession, too, was I, I loved math. I love you solve a math problem. You get a eureka moment. There's like an endorphin rush. There's a right and wrong answer. All the numbers fit. First, when I wrote an English paper, I was like, I got nothing. It might be great. It might be terrible. I don't know. So I told my father, I was like, I want to be a math major. And he's like, no, you don't. You can't get a job being a math major. But what's applied math? And I'm like, well, physics. And he's like, yeah, but like those people that make career out of physics get like into MIT when they're 14 and you're not that kid. So like what's applied physics? And I'm like engineering. And he's like, great. Now you're thinking. Okay. So then West Point offered civil, mechanical, and nuclear engineering. I think they offered chemical maybe. Nuclear sounded interesting to me. Uh, nuclear power plants seemed cool. And there was one course inside that major called the effects and design of nuclear weapons. So for a whole semester, we talked about how to effectively use weapons in the battlefield. And we got these cold war manuals, like do word problems. Like if I drop a bomb on an airfield, how long after that bomb detonates, can I send in a ranger battalion to seize the end 
airfield, assuming it takes like four hours to seize the airfield and we can't let them get sick from radiation. So we were doing these like Cold War war games as part of my academics. So, yeah. Man, I feel like I don't that's know how many people stuff. took a class on nuclear weapons, but like that was. Pretty- oh, I don't feel like that's available in too many different places, <laughs> yeah. but that's like the stuff nightmares are made of. So, wow. So, nuclear weapon, an entire course on nuclear weapons, like I said, that's that's got to be the stuff that nightmares are made out of. We saw the the recent movie Oppenheimer. Sure. What did you think of that movie? I loved it. I love the. Well, we had a, I forget what we called it. We had like a nuclear engineering club. We, we would get together and order pizza and talk about with the professors, like latest, either historic, the science behind it or new up and coming develops in the nuclear en- energy. And w- what I love about that time period is people don't under- appreciate the amount of engineering. They were like inventing things to invent things, to invent things, to make it happen. Like, okay, I need to make a bomb. Well, I need plutonium. Well, I don't know if plutonium is physically possible, so I need to make something to refine it. Like, the engineering, and it, I feel like they were all making it up as they went along. Like, it was it was that, that time period. They were really inventing so much technology and so much science. It's, I love that time period. It's fascinating. It's incredible. I mean, when you go through different type of, types of science classes, for me, I my science was all done in high school. And they tell you about theory and, oh gosh, you think about plutonium. You're saying that plutonium wasn't even really like a, it wasn't ever used. So it was just the theory that they had about plutonium when it came to, to using it as a weapon. I believe so. I feel like there's, there might be someone very astute watching this podcast. Like actually it was discovered oh, yeah. in 1937. He's not right. But like my understanding is that plutonium didn't exist until the Manhattan project. They had to, invented they had to invent a way to make it to make it and they were just like um, you know what i think this thing that doesn't even exist yet could work for this this project that we have so um and that's okay you, you weren't prepped on these questions so <laughs> well, I, this is just a wild goose this is a tangent that we decided to go down so we're going to shift gears a little bit here but <laughs> so very cool stuff I, I after school then when you finish west point what was duty like for you in the military? What, what walk me through that up until when you decided to get out? Yeah. So, um, I had a very weird path. I got out, I mean, infantry officer. So I went to Benning with, uh, airborne and, um, ranger school. And then I got to my unit in July and I was deployed in November. So very quick ramp up. And they actually deployed me as an S1 advisor. So infantrymen, and they're like, I remember talking to the commander. He's like, I've got one slot left on this deployment for an S1. And I want to give it to you because you got a ranger tab. I'm going to try to move you into a platoon leader slot once we get overseas. But like, you're going to go as an S1. Okay, I'll figure it out. Spoiler alert, I stayed an S1 the whole time. (laughs) But I did get to go out on missions with the guys. and I got to we were training the Afghan army. So the S fats, we were training the S the Afghan army, letting them take over bases. And then we would shut down that base, the U S president on the base and move to another one. So that was fun. Very, very different. After that, I was a reconnaissance platoon leader, which was awesome. Um, that was probably the most fun I had because we, I got to go to the air assault school, pathfinder school. And our job was to, on doctrine, we would go in 72 hours in advance of the brigade and gather intel and then report back. Um, so our training exercises were just my 18 man platoon, like out in the woods, we'd air assault in, uh, fast rope in, go hang out in the woods for three or four days, gather intel, and then come back. It was very autonomous, um, not a lot of oversight, which I loved. And then I went to the captain's career course and I was a basic training company commander. So I had four cycles of guys straight off the bus come through me and my drill sergeants. That was also a blast because I felt like I was giving back. Like I had gotten this, gotten this experience and I was able to help shape the next wave of soldiers. So yeah, that, and then around that time, 
I got married and there's like a break even point, I think with staying in the army, once you have leadership experience and you check that box, um, that's all civilians are going to see. So they don't, I was told, and I I think this is kind of true. Like if you're a Lieutenant or a captain or a major, like they don't care. Right. Um, so getting out in my late twenties with leadership experience, I'm competitive. Um, so the other point was I might as well stay in for retirement because like in the civilian world, I'm not getting more competitive as I stay in longer. Um, staying in for company command was something I personally wanted to do. So I'm glad I did that, but I had a long conversation with my wife and some other people important to me. I'm like, it's either, you know, make a career or get out now and, uh, decided to jump ship. So yeah, and I guess that leads into what we were talking about earlier is the transition, right? Like how do you package this diverse, weird, unique experience into the civilian sector? Like how do you end up being a chemical process engineer <laughs> like nothing in afghanistan or ranger school is going to set you up for that right that's right so i had the hardest time finding a job when i got out i, I had to laugh about some of your other speakers you've had on people just don't know what they're reading i, I had interviews um my favorite was there's a larger company that had they were big enough where I think they had like a veterans program like built into their HR. And I, and I sent my resume into this woman. I got a phone call interview and I was like, Hey, you said you have like a supervisor, junior leader, fast track program. I think I qualify. And she's like, well, you don't, but we want you to come in for an interview. I'm like, why don't I qualify? Like I have leadership experience. She's like, Oh, well it's for people that got out as an E6 or above. And I'm like, right. And she's like, you got out as an O3. I'm like, right. And she's like, six is bigger than three. And I was like, <laughs> you know what? I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Like if this is, and, and that was one of those experiences. I'm like, they really have no idea. So long story short, I had a mentor, old scout master from way back in the day when, Little Kevin was in Boy Scouts, who was a retired army guy. And I reached out to him. I hadn't talked to him in like a decade. And I was like, can you look at my resume? I know you retired. I don't really know what you did in the military, but I just remember from Boy Scouts that you were a vet. Like, look at my resume. And uh, come to find out he was a retired full colonel from the infantry. So wow. he, he he went over my resume and um, helped me translate things. And he ended up offering me a job. Oh my goodness. And, uh, yeah. Oh man. That first, that first job was amazing. My immediate boss was a uh, Naval E9 retired. Um, and then the other woman on the team, I'm not sure what she got out of. She didn't retire, but she was in the army as well. She was an interpreter, interrogator. She was an interrogator. Um, so I, I landed in a like very veteran friendly spot in this company in project management because I'd never really heard that term used, but any military operation from like going out to the range to planning, like all the planning we do in the military is project management. We just don't call it that. hundred percent. So yeah, I started there, uh, learned how to talk corporate. It's a hard language to learn. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, you, you have to transition that people in the military were all on a team. We want to get the mission done. The amount of people in the civilian sector that are like, listen, I'm here from eight to five and I collect a paycheck and um, I don't care if the customer's happy. I don't care if my boss is happy sometimes. Like I'm just doing my job and not getting fired. Not everyone. I mean, there's lots of great, great people, but there's more of that than what I was used to. So like, motivating people that really just want you to go away so they can like go back to watching YouTube or like they want to do their job and they don't care about helping you do your job. It was weird because we're not all on the same mission anymore. Right. Right. And those types of people, I I see those people all over the place. I feel like that is a symptom of you're not in the right place. You gotta, you gotta like, do a personal inventory and figure out who you are, where you want to be and 
I think if they were in a place that they were more, I guess, more cut out for uh, a job that's more fulfilling and that's something they're more passionate about, I think they would be more willing to help. Yeah, and I think that I think that's something you know we in leadership roles in the military if we're more focused on like the whole person, right? Um, and I think that's something that's helped me when I did eventually end up in leadership roles. It's like, what motivates you? Like, are you just doing this job because it's a stepping stone while you go back to college, or do you have a side hustle you're waiting to take off full time, or? Do you want to make a career here? Like what, what is motivating you to show up every day? And then let me tailor, you know, on kind of being the manager of a quality department. And I would have these conversations. I had one woman who was amazing and she was like, I will, I will bend over backwards for this department, but don't put me in charge of people. I was like, what? You should be the supervisor. Like we got a position opening up. She's like, do not put me in front of people. I will quit on you. And I'm like, Okay, well, I'm glad you, we had this conversation before I like threw your name in the hat because he would have got the job. He would have been mad. I would have been confused. Like, you got a promotion. Why are you quitting? But in reality, it's not what you wanted. That is so key. Understanding people is so key. Having conversations, getting to know the people you work with, trying to figure out what what makes them tick so that you can help them advance if that's what they want. You know, you can totally be their advocate and uh and their best friend if you if you know a little bit about them oh absolutely it's one of those it's yeah it's just like looking at the whole person and realizing like we 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 have lives outside of our professional life right and um yeah it, sometimes in the military i think because we do it is so all-encompassing transitioning to the to the professional world realizing like oh this job is such a smaller part of some people's lives and that's okay and that's probably healthy for a lot of people so, it is healthy yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely you got to have a good balance good balance between work and life so i i totally agree absolutely and that kind of led me so how did i end up in this current role well the other thing that's really different that jumps out to me is there is no career path in the civilian sector, right? Like for my example, I was going to be an infantry officer. I had to go to airborne and ranger school, check, check. Okay. I was in reconnaissance, had to go to air assault school, check, had to go to pathfinder school, check. They had to go to the captain's career course when I got promoted, check. Like there is a very linear, we like, approved solution for what a successful career looks like, you know, like a, like a blueprint. Sector, yeah. And in the civilian sector, there's not. So I kind of flopped around like, hey, what's next? And I realized no one was going to tell me. And because like my, my mentor, he was a project manager. And he's like, what do you mean? What's next? Like you're a project manager. Like for him, like that was the goal. And he was very, very good at it. And he, I mean, he was managing much larger projects than I was. I had to define like, what, what do, what does the end of my career look like? And then what are the milestones to get there? Right. So to draw an analogy, like, okay, if I want to be a Colonel, I know I've got to go to these schools. If I want to be a COO or a director of manufacturing, I had to like reverse engineer, like what is aerosol school in the, in the private sector? Well, for me, I went to get my PMP, my project manager professional certification. And yeah, you, I, I realized that my advice is you find an end state. And I think a few of your other people have talked about this is like, there's a dream and then break it into steps that you're actually going to take. And then it becomes a goal and it becomes achievable. Yeah, reverse reverse engineer. That's uh just reverse engineer that ideal state. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like you would you would backwards plan any anything you do in the military, you would figure out what skills your soldiers need to execute a squad live fire. You would start with a buddy team live fire, you'd start with an individual marksmanship. Yeah, if you want to be a business owner, you know, okay, I gotta learn whatever your weaknesses are you know, sales, accounting, design, logistics, like, and then go 
find people that are either going to teach you that skills, get jobs that that'll teach you those skills, or yeah, just just make a plan, right? So yeah, I think that was that was something that when you and I first first chatted, there were a lot of different types of management and training programs and and companies have like sales trainee programs and all these different programs are out there to get you from knowing nothing or just being very basic and foundational in a skill. And then the training program upskills, you get to where you need to be. And I think you mentioned like there was nothing out there for you. You, you were, you were essentially creating this, this, this training program for yourself. You were creating the Kevin Bright training program. (laughs) Well, yeah, I, I sort of did. I So I was in project management, and I got my project management professional. And then I realized, you know, I've never led people. I was dealing with projects, which I would equate to, like, planning, like, squad live fires. Like, lots of moving pieces, lots of logistics and people. But, like, no one, as a project manager, no one reports to you, which is super frustrating. It's like being in, like, an S3. Like you write the plan, you send it to the line units. They all say nasty things about you, but they make it happen. <laughs> I wanted to be a commander again. I wanted to be in charge of people. That's what that's what I, I'm passionate. I love people. Um, so I talked to the company, and they put me into a production line supervision role, which was fun. I didn't do the best at it, to be completely honest with you. A lot going on. One was. That was the the same time my second child was born. So waking up at like 4.30 to get to work for first shift. And then like I'd get home and my wife is like, here, take the screaming kid. And like the kid's getting up all night. I I didn't do great. It was not my best performance. And um, it sounds exhausting. (laughs) It was terrible. I, I should have asked for help and I should have been more vocal with my, the people at work. And that's something, that's another thing I, I learned from that experience was like, it's okay if a job doesn't work out. It's okay to fail at a job in, in the military. You know, we're taught like failure is not an option. And um, in the private sector, you can say like, hey, this, this role isn't for me. Bad timing, bad personality, bad culture. And a lot of people are like, okay, I waited. I ended up moving into engineering after that because eventually... I did. I did have to throw in the towel, but yeah, I was amazed too by how many people at the company that in like more senior executive positions were like, "Oh yeah, I had this terrible job back when I was in my thirties, and I got fired from it." Like, don't worry. Like, not every job's for everyone. It's okay. Like, we're gonna find a good fit for you. Like, just keep trying. As long as you put forth an effort, as long as you show us you're trying and you're trying to learn. But yeah, it ended up being a feather in my cap because now I had hands-on manufacturing experience. Like how do the parts physically get made, physically get in the box, physically get out the door to the customer because we don't get paid until we ship, right? So I I had that experience and the engineering was fine. And then another leadership position opened up in the quality department and I jumped into that right away. I wanted back into leadership, better timing. I was... And I did that for a few years, but I realized I got to the point where I was no longer learning and growing. And I had a conversation with some people. I was like, hey, you know, I I don't have a skill set for supply chain. I'd love to go work in supply chain and learn the logistics side. Finance, never, never touched it. I need to learn how to do this. Sales, sales is another area that I don't have any experience in. And people ask me, like, what do you want to do? And... The answer is kind of, let me explain my answer. It's like, I I guess the classic answer is like, I want to be the CEO. I don't actually know that I want to be a CEO, but I do know that if I'm on track to be a CEO and I find a job somewhere along the way that I really like, I can jump off the train and be happy because I found the job I like. But what I didn't want is I don't want to be like 55 and be like, I think I want to be an executive someday. Maybe I should go back to school and start like, like at that point, like it's, it's easier to, to get off the progress or get off a path. If I started earlier. So um, yeah, it kind of reminds me of the idea of like your, 
your end goal or your ideal state, in this case, the CEO, that's like you're trying to get to the top of the mountain and you're right now you're, you're standing in the woods somewhere and you're looking at the top of the mountain. You think that's where you want to go, but you don't really know until you get there. So you got to start walking and it's going to take you a while to get to the top of that mountain. But on your way, there's like rivers and streams and, and there's other patches of forest and, and different types of things that are really interesting. And like you said, you might find something else more interesting along the way that ends up taking all of your attention. Yeah, absolutely. And if I didn't broaden, you know, intentionally force myself into like, right now I'm in a sales engineering role. And it happened really serendipitously. I called someone I knew in the sales world. Excuse me. He, he was a family friend from way back in the day. And all I knew about him was that he was an engineer that sold stuff. And I thought he started his own business maybe. And I called him out of the blue and I'm like, listen, I'm in quality. I'm in residential and co like commercial manufacturing. You sell things. What is a, what does a career in sales look like? And he goes, Kevin, literally yesterday, our company approved a new sales position. You got to come in for an interview. And I'm like, Greg, like I, I'm so flattered, but like, I'm not job hunting. I'm not begging for a job. I just, I just want to talk about sales. And he's like, Kevin, I don't have time. I'm going to schedule an interview. Just come in and talk. We'll talk. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I've known this guy since like third grade. Like he's known my parents forever. Like I'll give him the time of day. And he goes in, he's like, you want to get jump into sales? Like blah, 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 blah. And um, here I am. <laughs> so and there you are um, right now in that role. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually I'm actually using his office because I don't I don't have my own office, but he, I told him what we were doing and he's like, yeah, jump in and uh, you know, take your time. That's awesome. That's so, awesome that you're you're able to do this interview while you're at work today. I think that's so cool. That's Well, it's, it's goofy, so I drive an hour to work. So if I started my drive if after this call. But um, That's true. You would be late if you did that. So it's cool that you were able to use the 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 facility for that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, How did it go? How did it go when you got into that role and what was the, the, lear the learning process like for you? It has been a baptism by fire. So I basically, someone will come to me and they'll say, I have hydro or I have sulfuric acid at this concentration. I want to dilute it. Um, it heats up sulfuric acid heats up when it gets mixed with water. I want to dilute it to a manageable temperature and then do something with it. And I kind of help design the equipment that's going to do that. And then I find the source of like, where are we going to buy the parts to make that equipment? Um, some of it we make in house. We do the assembly in house, but like sometimes we have to source parts of it. So then I'm costing it. Right. Um, so this is exactly what I asked for is learning sales, learning supply chain, is that outside my comfort zone? Absolutely. I have not done engineering since college. So, you know, last time I, I did any engineering was in 2011. And uh, now I'm doing like very intense engineering. So intellectually, it's kicking my butt every day. Um, good. But what, I, but what I've learned is I'm, I'm really good being uncomfortable. And, and that is something that I, I'm trying to do a better job at. Like, you know, I was an infantry officer, ranger school, and they're like, you're going to be an S1 personnel advisor to the Afghan army. No idea what I was doing. Right. And I, I did fine. And then I got stateside and they're like, you're going to be a reconnaissance platoon leader. It's like, guys, I'm really good at raids and ambushes and setting up patrol bases. Like nothing I've done is reconnaissance. And they're like, you'll figure it out, you know? Hey, you want to be a company commander? Like, yeah, I'm ready. Let's let's train for. At the time, it was like um, either Syria or North Korea was really hot in 2016, and they're like, "You're gonna be a company commander." Basic training, and I'm like, "I've never been in trade doc. I don't know how to train people at like a large systemic level." Um, so it's goofy. I joke with my with some people. I'm like, "I've never had experience doing my job." 
Like I, I, I've never had a job that I'm like, I've done that before and I know I can do it. It's always been something new and exciting. And like even this podcast, right? Like this is, this is outside my comfort zone, but um, forcing myself to do it because I want to share my story. And uh, I'm sure there's other veterans out there that are like, Oh, I don't have any experience doing anything. Or like, I'm just a knuckle dragger infantryman too. How am I going to get a job? And I'm like, you know, your skills are translatable. You, you, you're going to jump in and your ability to adapt to the unknown and problem solve. And like people are people. We need good leaders everywhere. So, yeah. And, and, you know, you're not going to have a career path laid out for you, but you know, you identify the skills, identify what you need to train on, either go find some, some academic thing that's going to give you a skill or go get a job. That's going to give you a skill. You know, jobs aren't just for earning a paycheck. Like you can, like I said, like I'm in a sales role because I wanted to learn how to sell. And that's the best way to do it is jump in and, uh, yeah, do it. That's just, that's so funny. Get your hands dirty. That reminds me of, uh, if you, if you ask for advice, somebody will give you money. And if you ask for money, somebody will give you advice. You asked for advice and they gave you a job and they're like, he asked for advice on how to do this job. He doesn't know how to do. I'm just going to give him the job. He doesn't know how to do. How's that sound? <laughs> That's perfect. Well, and well, that's actually, I mean, if you think about this, I got my first job. I asked, I asked a guy to go over my resume and he's like, you want to be a project manager? And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, no, I, I, I don't want to work in manufacturing and the company made furnaces and uh, water heaters. And I'm like, furnaces and water heaters have been around like 200 years. Like how interesting could this technology possibly be? First off, super complicated i had no idea the amount of of sophistication that goes into these household appliances so i i ate my foot or ate my hat really quickly right but there's really another glad. Thing on your, i'm really yeah. glad they're they're sophisticated because goodness uh we would be freezing when we're trying to get warm and we'd be really really hot when we're trying to get cold that would suck <laughs> but I, you were about to say something about another guest Oh, no, I think they mentioned he was looking for a job and people's advice was talk to people. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, I don't know. You just talk to civilians and like stuff happens. And that is so incredibly true. I, that's right. I was, <laughs> I had lunch with someone recently that was like, I, we were just catching up. He's in the IT world. He's like, you know, I know someone who just started a drone company. You should give him a call. I think he, he wants to hire veterans to like, design drones and i'm like i'm like buddy I'm, I'm not looking for a job i just wanted to have lunch and talk about like the wife and kids with you but like it's weird like you talk to people and stuff just like magically i can't explain it opportunities are everywhere and people love sharing them and and yeah if you if you talk to people stuff just happens it's amazing how that works absolutely yeah yeah the networking side um it's awesome. And, and like your podcast, right? Like you're, you're creating a network of people that want to be, um, I mean, I'm not speaking for like all the people on your podcast, but like, I imagine like the people who are coming on here, we're like, Hey, I want to network. I want to help people. If you're watching this and I can help you like shoot me, shoot me a note, you know, that's, that's really the, the attitude. That's, that's totally the, the DNA of anybody that, that is cool with, with doing this podcast it's all about networking it starts that way it starts as a conversation before we even hit the record button and then there's a time between our first conversation and actually doing the interview so yeah this is all about networking and and finding community within the veteran community really so you, you hit the nail on the head absolutely but, and i and i appreciate you being here i it's it's awesome because it, it is opening the door. I, as I do this podcast, as we have more of these interviews, more veterans are reaching out to me. So I have oh, less work awesome. to do. Yeah, I have less work to do to reach out to <laughs> other veterans to see if they're interested in doing it. I've got more people reaching out to me now telling me that they're interested, which is just is exactly what I wanted from this. So, but I want to I want to make sure obviously we're, we're coming up on time here. I want to, before I ask you the last question, was there anything else that you wanted to make sure that we 
we got into today? I don't think so. I mean, um, I guess like the, the highlights are, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Right. Yep. A lot of people see that as just more experience that makes your, your background more diverse, you know, design your career path, figure out what skills you need to get where you want to go. Cause no one's going to tell you what success looks like. Um, right. you got to define that for yourself. And then, yeah, network. Like, there's so many people willing to help. There's so many people in the same boat as you and I, and, and some of the other people. Are like, hey, I have never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't. Like, like, we're here for each other, right? We've. You'd be amazed how many people have similar experiences. So, That's what this is all about. This is just. This is us showing up, so that other people out there know we're here. We're here if you need someone to talk to. I may not be able to have the answer for your pro problem, but I probably know somebody who does have the answer or knows somebody who has the answer. So yeah, if, if, if you're in need career advice, you, you just need some help, need somebody to talk to. That's what this is all about. These, uh, these faces are, are here to help. Absolutely. So, well then you already answered the advice question. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, yeah, don't be afraid to fail is key. If I if I would have been afraid to fail, I never would have started this podcast. This podcast is is gradually improving incrementally, episode by episode. But when I started it, I had no idea what I was doing. I just got lucky with a really awesome guest that uh, that pretty much carried the entire show. And uh, I feel that way about a lot of these shows, these episodes. My guests come on and they've got really awesome things to talk about and uh, and they carry it. So thank you for carrying this episode today, Kevin. No, oh, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you having here. And um, yeah, I'm glad I could, I could share my story. Yeah, it's a good it's a good one. Everything from nuclear weapons all the way to 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 trial by fire sales careers. So, but I'm going to let you get back to it. I know that you've got, uh, you've got some work to do, buddy. So I do, I do. Christmas is coming and the end of year sales is uh, hot and heavy. So <laughs> you gotta, you gotta buy those Christmas presents. So I'm going to let you, uh, let you get back to, to producing, but thanks again, sir. We'll, uh, I'll be in touch with you here very soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You too. this episode of Amplify Veterans. I want to emphasize the importance of supporting our veterans in times of need. If you or someone you know is struggling, remember, help is always available. The Veterans Crisis Line provides confidential support 24-7. Reach out to them by dialing 988 and then select option one. You can also go to veteranscrisisline.net for more information.